Mes invités, chers collègues, Monsieur le Commissaire, au nom de la Banque africaine de développement, euh, je vous remercie de m'avoir invité de partager avec vous notre analyse euh, sur cette question. Et je remercie très sincèrement Sa Majesté le Roi, le gouvernement du Royaume du Maroc et son peuple pour cette initiative. Et merci pour l'amabilité qui me permet euh, de donner mon engagement à Marrakech. Je ferai mon intervention en anglais, si euh, vous le permettez, mais j'ai un document à distribuer dans les deux langues, le français et l'anglais. I think this initiative is excellent. Now, before I uh, try to narrow down on the issues of uh, concern, uh, first of all, I think, uh, Mr. High Commissioner, you are a very courageous person to invite a banker, because nowadays we are not very much welcome at the dinner parties. But I think we still have one or two things to say about the world uh, at this time. You have asked me to, to concentrate my attention not on the historical links uh, via the Atlantic region with Africa, history which is old and new, uh, sometimes painful, sometimes less painful, challenges which are old and new, <clears throat> but to reflect with you what this financial crisis means uh, for this relationship. Now, you have allowed me to speak under Chatham House rules, which means I cannot be quoted, and, and I thank you for that. But I will be distributing a document which can allow you to quote aspects of my statements. <clears throat> now, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, a very good friend of mine, a very bright man, has aptly defined what the Atlantic region means for us and for the world. Uh, <coughs> Over the last few months, something has struck my mind. Uh, Africa's first failed state is uh, Somalia. That is Africa's first failed state. It has been in crisis since 1990, the longest crisis <coughs> on the uh, African continent. Now, sometimes we had an impression that this crisis has been abandoned for Africans to deal with until, of course, the pirates arrived. And when the pirates began to threaten international commerce, then the matter became a matter of world attention. And that is as it should be. <clears throat> Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because <clears throat> in the course of this crisis, financial crisis, as different parts of the world look for solutions, you have a feeling that people think they can resolve the issues at the epicenter of the financial crisis and secondarily in the emerging markets. And then we shall come to the issues of Africa later when we have resolved all the issues of the financial crisis. And the message I want to leave here is that it cannot be. It cannot be. In the same way as we could not ignore the problems of Somalia failed state until the pirates bring into attention. It is impossible to say we shall resolve the issues of the financial crisis on the northern parts and the western part of the Atlantic while leaving the low-income countries outside the agenda of discussion. It cannot be. And I will explain. <clears throat> People have said to us, but what kind of solution are you looking for? Africa is only 2% of world trade, if you include oil and minerals. And therefore, the continent is not systemically important. Now, <clears throat> I go back to the issue of Somalia, to the issue of Somalia. If we are not able to address some of these teething problems on the face of the world, whether it is climate change, it is migration, issues of the drugs, I think this crisis has shown how interlinked we all are. And so what I've been saying is that in order to resolve uh, this uh, crisis, which for us is basically an economic crisis, we need an inclusive solution. <clears throat> and an inclusive solution does not mean that all of us should sit in the G20. That is not the issue. 
but it has to be a solution which concerns all. And I want to put on the table that it needs three components. You cannot stimulate demand in the world economy, ignoring 900 million Africans. And uh, Mr. High Commissioner, since this discussion is about 2030, in 2030 the population of Africa will have changed significantly at the face of the world. And therefore it is not possible to stimulate world demand forgetting the, the African continent. Now, you can stimulate demand in uh, automobile factories in the north or on the other side of the Atlantic, but at the end of the day, uh, the 900 million Africans could be part of the solution instead of being a problem to be resolved. But there's something even much more uh, pertinent at this time. I happen to be sitting with the Prime Minister of Ethiopia in the margin of the G20, and I listen to the discussions on transparency in the financial sector, which of course is the basis for us to get back to confidence. But one then asks the question, Transparency for who? Because for many of our countries, the tax havens are not tax havens as such. They are havens for criminal money. Money taken from the African continent, which are then kept in these tax havens. So for us, it's not a taxation issue. It's an issue of capital flight. And therefore, the issue was, how can we have this kind of transparency for everyone? How can we ensure that if we're looking for money, which is a result of a capital flight, how can you have access to these resources? Many of you, you recall that uh, I think the former president of Nigeria, President Obasanjo, worked very hard to recover money which had been stolen from his country. And it was a long, long process. And at the end of the day, he was only able to recover a portion of that money. That is the kind of transparency which is important for everyone. And that is the transparency which will make the relationship between all parts of the Atlantic inclusive. <clears throat> Let me mention a third part of the global governance which will make this tripartite relationship meaningful. And that is one to do with what I call equitable treatment. I'm not talking about equal treatment. I'm talking about equitable treatment. Let me explain. In the last 30 years, many of the African countries, including uh, Kingdom of Morocco, have worked very hard to reform their economies. It was a long battle, 30 years, some even longer. But over the last decade, uh, the African countries began to do quite well in terms of reforming their economies. Now suddenly they're hit by this uh, tsunami. Some are managing better than others. But then they ask questions. How could it be that uh, when Iceland was hit by the crisis, it was able to get a solution inside a week, but when an African country tries to get the same, it takes them months of long negotiations and a list of conditionalities? Now, I understand that the crisis in Iceland was systemically important. But what then Africans have a right to ask but where is equitable uh, treatment? Now, I think that more and more these questions are going to be asked in the new phase of globalization. It is not the issue of being the G20 or the G8. It's about of transparency for who? Equitable treatment and a stimulus for all. The President of the World Bank had suggested that in this search for a solution, a 0.7% of all the stimulus packages be left to try and help emerging countries, low-income countries, to be part of the solution. We didn't succeed, but I think it is important that this matter remains on the agenda, especially of the G8 and the next G20. Now, when I talk about Africa, of course, I am fully aware that Africa is 53 countries, 53 countries about 40 or so currencies, with almost 700 million people in about a dozen countries, many of the countries smaller populations, and therefore the impact of the crisis is different from country to country. 
in this region of North Africa, the impact is much less immediate for now. In the Eastern African region, the impact is also less felt. But in Central Africa, in Southern Africa, the impact is quite deep and serious. And we think that Africa is paying a high price, a very high price, for the problem it did not cause. And therefore, for us, any recalibrating of global governance can only mean, can only mean an equitable, inclusive treatment for all. Otherwise, the issues I think the Minister of Foreign Affairs has mentioned very well. The, the Gulf of Guinea uh, in Equatorial Africa provides almost 25% of oil for the American market. But also, increasingly, some of these nefarious trades, like drug trade in the Gulf of Guinea, is becoming to be a big problem. And therefore, we have common endeavors, common challenges. But it cannot be that it is Africa which will pay the price to resolve those problems when these are the same time paying the price for a crisis which is not of its own making. It is difficult to explain that uh, when the crisis began, the thinking was Africa would not be affected because it is not part of the world market. Indeed, the thinking then was that maybe it will take 18 months, 24 months. But the crisis came very quickly because one of the first things to be affected was uh, migrant remittances, a result of another link between the Atlantic countries. A country like uh, Cape Verde, Cape Verde in the middle of the Atlantic, which has got a large population in Boston, a large population in Europe, <coughs> has been hit seriously by uh, Remittance is a decline. <clears throat> now, Cape Verde was on the way to graduate from being an aid dependent to a capital market dependent country. But I think it would take them a bit longer. Now, one could conceivably ask is there no way in this new global architecture where we could help countries like Cape Verde, who are in the middle of this Atlantic relationship, now suffering uh, tourism losses, remittance losses, and lower export opportunities? I cannot imagine a better example of this Atlantic relationship than this uh, small archipelago of the Cape Verde, which is sitting between Europe, the Americas, and Africa. And which is an example of how this global relationship, whether on the downside or on the upside, affects all of us. But it cannot be that during the time of crisis, then these countries like Cape Verde are put on the back banner until the issues at the epicenter of the crisis have been resolved. Now, let me say briefly, and I'll stop there, High Commissioner, in terms of what we are doing at the bank. We are Africa's own bank, and it is our role to play a, a small contribution. Here in Morocco, we are the country's first partner. We are the number one partner of Morocco. And we made a small contribution to what the Moroccans themselves have been doing to develop their economy, and work with them to try and develop the private sector and also the public investments. Our challenge, our challenge is how to, to overcome this balkanization of the continent, 53 countries, over 40 currencies. Now, I'm not talking about political integration. The Minister of Foreign Affairs is more expert than I. I'm talking about economic integration, economic integration. Because if we could get this force of 900 million people economically integrated, I think the relationship in the Atlantic area would be quite different. And therefore, our emphasis is to develop the regional markets, regional infrastructure, to try to develop skills such that the trade between North Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa can increase. And we are looking to increase very much this kind of uh, activities within the limits of our means. So, Mr. High Commissioner, Ministers, let me summarize my thinking in the following one word. The Atlantic region has been <clears throat> the center of our participation in the global process. Sometimes very painfully, sometimes less so. Sometimes in a beneficial way, sometimes less beneficial. But what is 
clear that we're all in the same boat at this time. And I'm saying that if uh, we are to come up with a new global structure which ensures benefit for all, it has to be inclusive, it has to be equitable, and it has to be transparent for all. So thank you very much, uh, High Commissioner. Thank you again for inviting a bank. I think it's very courageous of your part. And if what I've said causes you problems, this is Chatham House Rules. I'll send you a much more uh, diplomatic paper. Thank you very much. Thank you.